everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Alvaro Huerta, and I'm very happy to have a guest speaker here at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, we have a series with uh, working with the library, our great librarians, the staff, the dean, also the Wakeland Center is supporting us with, with these events. Uh, I'm a professor, associate professor of ethnic and women's studies and urban and regional planning. And I'm very excited here to present our, our guest speaker. And this is something new for us uh, because we rarely have uh, people that are in STEM. And I was actually a former math major. I always talk about myself because I'm a middle child and I was ignored and I didn't get a cake. So even if the talk is not about me, I always have to insert myself. So in 1985, I don't think Rebecca was alive. I was uh, a freshman at UCLA, I was a math major. And I was going to actually do a freshman summer program at, at Jet Proportion Laboratory, JPL. Uh, they had the Galileo there, and, but I decided to do the freshman summer program. So I've always been fascinated with math, uh, with science, with robotics. Uh, but because I still have a MySpace account, I'm really technologically uh, behind. Uh, and this is why I decided to invite Rebecca, or a fellow Ford fellow, uh, to come and speak to us about her research, her interest, and in, in how is it that we can learn from the type of research that she's doing and in, in looking at the, with the lens of, of justice, racial justice, social justice issues. Uh, but I, at the end of the day, I'm going to you know, let her speak. I'm just going to just briefly introduce her, and then, and then she'll take it from there. So our brilliant guest speaker is Rebecca. Ramat, Ramnat, I probably butchered your name. Uh, people call me like Alvarado and they even call me Jose. So they always butcher my name. So I, I don't know, maybe you and I have- You got better. it correctly. You got yeah, it yeah. Rebecca Ramnat. <laughs> yeah, Re Re okay. So she's a PhD candidate at Yale University. And so take it away. Awesome, great. Let me share my screen. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Uh, which screen am I seeing? The one that says social robotics for equitable future, right? Yes. Okay, great. No, I have good. three screens set up here, so I'm never sure which one. <laughs> you're, um, like tra you're trading stocks. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all. It's Monday evening. It's, it's really dark outside here in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And I guess it might even be the last hour of the workday for you. Um, so I just want to thank you first uh, for, you know, sharing your time with me today. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Rebecca Ramnot. I am currently wrapping up my PhD in computer science here at Yale University. Uh, so before Yale, I was actually an assistant dean of research and program development at Long Island University, their, their School of Business. And before then, I was a software engineer in New York City and a lecturer at various colleges for almost a decade now. <laughs> so it feels like a while. Um, I'm also a colleague of Dr. Alvaro through our Ford Foundation Network. And we've been working together and as a network of professionals to respond to the news about the end of the Ford Foundation fellowships. Um, which have traditionally supported uh, diversity and equality and inclusion across many, many campuses in America. So when he gave me this opportunity to talk, I knew I wanted to not only uh, just share my research, but also highlight the conversations of diversity and equality that truly seep into every area of research possible. Uh, so I've specifically tailored my talk today to showcase important conversations and design choices that we as engineers and you as listeners to consider that aren't immediately obvious in my work. Um, so today I will begin by introducing to you what social robotics is all about, and then I'll highlight a few projects that I've worked on that have grown outside of my lab and into the real world into the hands of real users. 
And then lastly, I will list a few ways my research promotes equitable futures for our users and also the people that create that technology. Um, yeah, so before I start, actually, I would love to share my slides. I know this is very uncommon, but I've had students who are logging in on small screens and they like to have the slides even after this talk is finished. So I'm gonna paste the, the presentation in the chat. So when this talk is over, you'll have it. <laughs> you'll have my contact information as well. Yeah, you can just Venmo me 9.99, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's no bit of on there. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'll begin. So aside from appreciating the, the mechanical or technical design of robots, I focus on the social contributions of robots. So traditional robotics focuses on things like reliability or precision of motion, like in self-driving cars or automated conveyor belts. But the recent field of socially assistive robots focuses on things like emotional expressiveness or robustness during a social interaction. And robots as tools for social interactions have shown increased engagement, increased levels of attention, more appropriate social behaviors in groups of people when robots are part of that interaction. In fact, some people not only enjoy interacting with robots, but in many cases demonstrate much more appropriate social behaviors with robots than they do with their human peers. And I think that's a really, really interesting effect. So interesting, I dedicated the rest of my career to studying that. And I've, I used to wonder why, why? Why do robots have that impact on people? And in my experience over the years, I think it's because uh, robots occupy a special niche on this spectrum of sociability, where on one end you have inanimate objects like toys, which don't elicit any social behaviors whatsoever. And on the other end, very animate social beings that could be a source of overwhelming confusion or distress uh, for certain individuals like those with autism. And then from a researcher's point of view, being able to modulate where on this spectrum of sociability a robot may fall can actually help us develop systems that elicit more positive and productive interactions. It allows us to use robots as tools for understanding human behavior. And to demonstrate some of these claims, I would love to walk you through four of my recent projects, which are four proven applications for social robots. So the development of robots might be the last thing on your minds when talking about coronavirus. Um, but the nature of the pandemic actually has emphasized a lot of gaps in our daily lives for which robots can fill social roles. For example, addressing mental health challenges or supplementing distance learning. So during the pandemic, we developed a robot teleoperation system for elementary school age children to engage in physical play while being geographically separated. And this means that children can control the behaviors of and communicate through robots that were located in their friends' homes. And our objective for the study was to explore whether social robots can actually combat the effects of social isolation in children. And at the start of the pandemic, we released our robot system to the general public free of charge and donated over 300 robots to families who could not otherwise afford it at that time. And in just three months, about 2,000 people were actively using our system. And we analyzed the results and along with the feedback that users have given us, suggest that robots can have a role in providing a fun and safe mechanism for individuals to interact socially during global pandemics. And you know, during its continued use, we actually discovered that there is a interest and a real need for a platform like ours. One of our main takeaways was that robots can improve access to personalized, socially situated and physically co-present interactions. Another application for social robotics is for children with disabilities. 
Several years ago in 2018, we conducted the first ever in-home long-term robot study that was designed to help kids with autism learn social skills. Autism is becoming one of the fastest growing developmental disabilities in the United States. Uh, when my younger sister was diagnosed, the statistic for autism for an autism diagnosis was one in 128 people, and now it's one in 33. A few hallmarks of autism are difficulty communicating with others and showing appropriate social behavior. And since autism is a spectrum, there is no one size fits all uh, treatment for it. And we thought that this would be such a unique application for personalized social robots. So we call this our 303030 project. Our goal was to put 30 robots in 30 homes to interact daily with families for 30 days. And we designed this robot to work autonomously in the home, which means that once we delivered and set up the system, there is no need for any researcher to be present at any point in the study. And families were able to interact with the robot in a natural setting, as opposed to having to come into a lab and adjust their behaviors for an unfamiliar environment. And the robot engaged uh, the, ch the child with autism through a series of learning tasks that appeared on the screen. And over time, the robot encouraged the child to engage their caregiver in that same task. And by the robot modeling appropriate uh, eye contact and behavior, the children quickly learn social skills to better engage with other members of their families. And this very quickly became a successful interaction for autism because it not only uh, was effective at maintaining engagement with the child over time, but it showed a potential for improving social skills in children that transfer to other people outside of this particular human robot interaction. And after this study, we were left with a huge data set over 200 hours of video recordings uh, paired with performance metrics. And right now I'm working on a series of algorithms that describe the behaviors of the children with autism in a clinically meaningful way. And most studies that, that exist on autism are usually conducted in, in a very sterile environment, such as a laboratory or a clinical setting. And there are many restrictions on where and what a participant can do. But what's unique about our study in my line of research is that it's in their homes. It's in a dynamic and unstructured, but very comfortable and familiar environment for our participants to interact naturally. And I believe it's this kind of, of natural data that can tell us a lot about autism as a diagnosis and move us closer to providing resources that, is, that could better support these users. So this study in 2018 is now one of many robot-based interventions that provide on-demand personalized social skills training for autism. But just looking at these photos, these studies seem to have one main thing in common. They're designed for children. Most, if not all, robot-based interventions for autism at this, at this moment are designed for children. And, and I, just I just wonder, do researchers forget that children eventually grow up and become adults? Because I, I wonder, uh, what kind of support exists for adults with autism? So in response to this, we design the first ever robot system that targets social skills training in adults with autism in their homes. And finding and maintaining a job can be an important milestone in adulthood. Over 85% of adults with autism are currently uh, unemployed or underemployed. So the service gap here is extremely large. As a result, we set out to design a system that would be the first attempt to addressing this problem of unemployment for adults with autism. And it's a very tough problem to even try to solve. I interviewed 35 adults with autism on the potential barriers to their employment. And many spoke about the impact of interruptions. 
According to our research, it takes over six minutes for an adult with autism to resume a task after being interrupted. One participant with autism explained how disruptive interruptions can be. She says, that's how I am. I'm perfectly focused in the moment, getting things done. But then I'm interrupted and it derails me. It takes me a while to get back on task and even longer to deal with my frustration. Sometimes I take it out on the people around me and sometimes I just feel silly for just not knowing what to do. So the ability to handle and answer and recover from interruptions quickly and appropriately is an essential skill for everyone. But training can be especially helpful for people who find interruptions to be socially debilitating. So we built this in-home, fully autonomous, robot training system that allows adults with autism to practice handling interruptions. And like our previous study, this was a very fruitful way of learning more about autism, especially in adulthood. And the training was also proven to be effective at improving our users' ability to handle interruptions better and with ease. So in all, the social robot we designed has proven successful at providing support for adults with autism in an area of their lives where there are very, very few targeted supported systems. And I don't know if you've already noticed, but many of my projects fo focus on autism and that's because I have that personal connection with my sister. But I've also noticed that some of the difficulties that individuals with autism face are actually pretty common to the general population. For example, anxiety. We recently built a tactile desk robot to allow people to make deep breathing exercises a natural part of their daily routine. We left our robot in our university's wellness center and observed how people approached the robot and used it to reduce their anxiety. This was a very short study, but we had already found out that our robot has the potential to significantly reduce anxiety during this short-term interaction, and that this kind of physical interaction with a robot can actually be intuitive and approachable and very engaging. So these are just four applications for social robotics. I know I just rushed through that and I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to it, but I think you can sense there is a kind of theme to my research. You know, computer science is a very broad field and I've taken this very small slice of it to study. And I like to say that I develop theories about how people uniquely think and learn and interact with the world around them. And then I put these theories on embodied platforms such as socially assistive robots to best support our users. And if you're interested in learning more about my particular projects or what I've been up to recently, feel free to check out my website or send me an email. Um, but I also want to transition into talking specifically about creating equitable futures as it relates to my work. If I interpret this, this term equitable futures to mean, how does my, my work promote equality and diversity in the near future? Then I think I've made my answer a little bit obvious. It's that I build technology that makes support for people with special needs more accessible. But I think that answer, although it's true, kind of grazes over the economical origins of the term equitable. And I just want to bring up a couple of concerns that I've heard about this line of research. Um, for example, one of the biggest concerns that I hear from people about my work is that I build technology to be a placeholder for humans. And that the kinds of systems that I create is really an effort to replace parents or teachers or therapists. But my response to this is that there honestly can never really be a replacement for real human to human interaction. And we know this over the Zoom era, um, but all of my projects are actually a result of coming together as a community of researchers, parents, caregivers, teachers, and therapists. And as you've seen in my research, the goal is actually to encourage our users to build the skills that they need to interact be better and more often with other people. 
And that the robots that we put into homes or into classrooms actually promote social behavior beyond the robot and can be useful tools for teachers to engage their students or for parents to engage their children. Another valid concern that comes up often when we talk about my research is the cost of these systems. These robots require a lot of hardware and even require specialized equipment to put them together. And since the products of my research don't really stay in the lab, they actually end up in homes. So the question becomes, who can really afford to spend $1,800 on a robot? So when I create these systems, I was conscious about the costs that they would present to users and the fact that expensive systems would appeal mainly to a wealthy demographic. And in response to this concern, I have to recognize that my research is very early stage, that these systems were built by me, assembled by me, uh, delivered by me, and the effects analyzed by me, all on a PhD student stipend. Um, this, the systems that I design are clearly not up to the stage of being commercially available yet. But if and when these robots hit mass production, manufacturing will certainly decrease the cost by a massive order of magnitude. And in the meantime, I have worked with local families and public school uh, classrooms to donate systems uh, for them to use completely free of charge. And that's because I see it as an important and necessary tool for our society, this access to technology that is tailored to people's uh, like real problems and real needs. And then as scientists and as engineers, we are in a position to change the world, not just study it. And to create equitable futures, I not only consider the futures of the people using my technology, but also the future and the diversity of the people making this technology. And that's why I've chosen to pursue um, like a career in higher education, to be able to work with students and to build diverse communities within the schools. Um, and STEM, STEM fields in higher education, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen it, it's, it's still traditionally white and male dominated. But I'm actually glad to witness firsthand the vast diversity of people that I've worked with and have the opportunity to work with within my field. And with that, I have hope that this might be the norm for the next many years to come. But anyway, um, that's a very brief introduction to social robotics. And I think it's a good in overview of the work that I do and the vision that I have for it. And like I said, and I continue to tell my students is that we're in a position to change the world, not just study it. And I'm really excited for what the next few years hold for my research. So thank you for sharing your time with me. I'm gonna stop right here and open the floor up to any questions or comments that you might have. Rebecca, can you uh, just stop sharing the... Okay, everybody applause. She's actually my cousin, so everybody better applaud. <laughs> that was brilliant. That was amazing. I really appreciate how you took on this very um, complex topic and, and, and you communicated in a way that, that those of us that are not in STEM, I'm, I'm an urban planning, can understand. Um, and I know I, I'm sure a lot of our students appreciate that as well.